Hello, tubers and connoisseurs. Привет from CollectRussia.com, the place for Russian and Soviet military, and by Russian I mean Imperial Russian, and Soviet military, and medals, and orders, and all stuff military. Today we're here with Igor Moiseev, the captain of the ship, who will enlighten us on another very interesting subject. Igor, hi. What do you have for us today? Hello there. Uh, today we'll be discussing uh, a very interesting subject, in my opinion, and that's Soviet naval medals. Mm. There are two of them, and both are very unique in their own right. And uh, we will start with part one, which is Ushakov medal, mm. the, low, the higher uh, of the two. Right. Uh, and they're pretty scarce, I mean. And both of them are very scarce, and I'll explain why. Okay. And I'll explain also what sets them apart from everything else that Soviets had up to that point or even afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, the medal uh, of Usha Ushakov medal, or medal of Ushakov, depending on how you translate it, uh, was established in March of 1944. So pretty late in the war. That, by the way, partly explains why it's scared, but we'll get to that. Uh, so you can see that by that time, majority of Soviet wartime medals uh, were, had been issued for quite, for quite a long time. They um, sometimes were issued by in tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question comes up, why so late in the war a completely different medal? Mm -hmm. Why naval medal? And for that, we need to look at how whole Soviet award system developed over the years. As we know very well, uh, Soviet uh, Union and before it Bolshevik Russia uh, came up as a totally egalitarian state. Uh, everybody was supposed to be equal, which of course wasn't true in reality. But before that reality became apparent and they were no longer trying to hide it, mm -hmm. there was a long development. And it started with Order of Red Banner, as we know, during the Civil War that was issued equally to any ranks, in fact, the officer ranks were abolished uh, as right. one of the first actions of the Soviet regime. Uh, and uh, then slowly but surely, new things appeared, orders first, and that was, of course, very imperial idea that was initially abolished, but well, order of Lenin, order of uh, Major Warner, and so forth, to set people aside, to show that they're special class, then there were special titles over, all of a sudden, unthinkable before, mm -hmm. a title of Hero of the Soviet Union, uh, laureate of Stalin Prize and Lenin Prize before that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, more and more, uh, then there were campaign medals, of course, for the early campaigns. And then eventually, in 1944, all of a sudden, naval orders, and that's a matter for separate discussion, they're extremely rare and very interesting, Order of Fushakov and Order of Nahimov. And as a continuation of these two orders, uh, in a sort of lower degree of the order, uh, there was establishment of two medals, Ushakov medal and Nahimov medal. And you can see that already it deviates from previous Soviet tradition. If there was an order of something, order of badge of order, order of Lenin, there would be no classes initially mm -hmm. in that declaration. Oh, okay. uh, there would be no medal of Lenin. There would be no medal of badge of order. There would be something completely different. Uh, there would be medal for valiant labor, for example, but they wouldn't call it a medal of honor mm -hmm. quite yet at that point. By 1944, again, all the pretense was pretty much off. In 1943, as we know, they reconstituted uh, shoulder boards. Absolutely unthinkable right. prior to that because they hated the idea of you know, officer caste with their own special uniforms mm -hmm. and shoulder straps. So that was unthinkable prior. Even earlier in 1940, just when they completed with the purge of the Red Army, right. uh, they reestablished general ranks. Again, something that would be previously unthinkable. So in 1943, uh, all that pomp and circumstance, uh, special uniforms, special classes of people, all this is already fully established. And just as they establish Order of Ushakov for higher 
personnel for officers exclusively at oh. this point. Mm -hmm. Again, something that never was practiced before. There was no such thing as order of Lenin for officers. Are you think? Are you kidding? No, absolutely not. It was for anybody. You could be the collective for uh, the last you know collective farmer, or you could be uh, a professor at the university, or you could be a so politician. It was purely meritorious. Exactly. Uh -huh. But now, lo and behold, there are classes. There are classes of people, a special class of people being commissioned officers who are the only ones who could possibly get Ushakov, Order of Ushakov in the first mm -hmm. or second class. First class, in fact, was reserved for only the top echelon of the Navy. Same pretty much with Order of Nahimov, first and second class. But that leaves out naval ranks that are lower, naval NCOs, petty officers, and uh, enlisted mm -hmm. sailors. And they decided that it would be very opportune at this point to establish this new award for enlisted ranks as well. And it was roughly an equivalent of Valor Medal, a Medal for Bravery, uh -huh. with one very big distinction. Medal for Bravery could be awarded to anybody, again. Including naval. In including, na well, not only that, but any rank could receive right. any officer, even a general conceivably, although that rarely practiced, it was practiced in, in real life. But uh, in theory, Marshal of the Soviet Union could get Medal for Bravery, if, if whatever fit. And you could actually see that early in the war, they occasionally awarded bravery medals to officers. Mm -hmm. Later, uh, with Ushakov Medal and Himov Medal, the difference was that only enlisted ranks could get the medal. Just like only officers could get the order, the continuation, the lower class. And that harkens back to imperial times. There was uh, a practice in the days of the Tsars, uh, which of course Soviets reasonably hated and didn't want to emulate in any shape, way, or form. Uh, back then, there were continuations of officers' awards. There was Order of St. George, an extremely important right. decoration in four classes. And even the lowest fourth class for most of Russian history, except for the last days during the provisional government, could only be awarded to officers. Uh, there was also a continuation of this award, uh, St. George Cross, as it was late, late, right. later known in the, in the last years, uh, that was awarded in mass to enlisted personnel. All four classes could only be awarded to enlisted men and NCOs. Unlike officers, it was essentially a continuation of the war. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Order of Saint Anne. There was a an Order of Saint Anne in three classes, uh, plus fourth class, which was basically either for either for foreigners or for uh, for weapons for people awarded with honorary weapon. So that was fourth class. Mm -hmm. But then, as a continuation, there was also a medal or badge of distinction of Saint Anne for enlisted ranks and NCOs. So now we see a fully developed system of ranks, privileges, and classes. So that's that's a curious thing about Ushakov Medal. Uh, established in March 1944. Uh, why such a late date? Well, we can only theorize, but I would say at that point, uh, Navy finally, Soviet Navy finally started to play an important role in the war. Caught up with the rest of it. Exactly. Uh, up until that point, Navy was engaged uh, in, 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 in a couple of features, specifically in the Black Sea, um, but it was mostly in defensive role. Mm -hmm. There was evacuation from the Soviet uh, northwestern possessions, Estonia, Latvia, uh, from uh, evacuation of the naval base at Hanko. Uh, and it was sort of ignominious uh, re retreat. It wasn't anything to write home about. Mm -hmm. For much of the war, the heart of the Soviet Navy, Baltic fleet, was marooned uh, at Kronstadt and Leningrad, a completely bottlenecked, uh, to such an extent that they removed the turrets from battleships and used them on land. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of naval personnel took part in uh, fighting as regular infantry, pretty much, uh, because there was no other role for them to play. Uh, Russian Navy uh, was practically neutralized in the Baltic fleet, sea uh, basin and also uh, was put to very hard uh, put put on very hard to, uh, it was a very bad situation in on the black sea uh, it had to evacuate many of the bases such as sevastopol crimean basin
bases, mm -hmm. uh, Novorossiysk and major naval base, and was again bottlenecked uh, along the uh, eastern shore of the Black Sea. Uh, and uh, a lot of ships were sunk, a lot of submarines were lost. We can talk about it for forever, but uh, just to give you an idea, Soviet submarines, because they were uh, playing a wrong role, so to speak, mm -hmm. carrying, for example, ammunition to besieged cities, such as Sevastopol or Odessa, mm -hmm. evacuating personnel from those cities when they were about to fall, evacuating civilians, uh, they were in terrible, terrible situation. And uh, Soviet Union started the war with approximately 200 submarines uh, running, uh, plus some that were under construction. Uh, Soviet Union completed about 150 of the top of my head, maybe 200 submarines during the war. Mm -hmm. And you know how many were left at the end? 200. They, lo they lost in one way or another to Luftwaffe, to naval mines and so forth, accidents, they lost half of the submarines of the available inventory of submarines. Mm -hmm. So attrition was terrible. Wow. So there was really not very <clears throat> much to brag about in the early years of the war, as far as Navy was concerned. Air Force was different. Army was very different, of course, we know about battle stuff, Stalingrad and so forth. Navy, it was so bad at some point that Stalin ordered capital ships to stay out of the fighting in the uh, in the Black Sea uh, basin for the fear of losing the entire service mm -hmm. fleet. So most of the action was by small boats, torpedo boats and uh, submarines and right. so forth. Of course, naval aviation was very active throughout the war. But the point is, by 1944, situation had changed. Now, Soviet Navy was out at the, and about. Uh, Soviet Navy would play a huge role in the attack on Crimea in May of 1944, uh, when they, to a very large extent, interceded with the attempted evacuation of Romanian and German troops. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the Germans managed to escape, but also many were lost because of the actions, very, uh, very successful in Soviet Navy. There were some naval landing operations that took place in late 43, early 44, again, capturing um, uh, a breachhead in the Crimea that was later used uh, a few months later in the capture, in the recapture liberation of the peninsula. And uh, uh, there were successes, limited, but, but you know, uh, noticeable uh, in the, finally, in the Baltic Basin, when uh, some successful naval assaults were launched uh, throughout 1944, uh, naval landings. So, at that point, Soviet leadership realized that Navy is starting to finally, finally, Soviet Navy is starting to play a big role, and it will definitely be acquired to build a huge fleet in the post-war years. They were already looking past that, past the uh, Second World War and into Cold War, which was obvious to them was coming. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, there would be confrontation, they thought, with the Western world, with the former allies of the Soviet Union, and that's when Navy uh, will be important. Also, it's a matter of prestige. Stalin, like other dictators, Miguel Maniax, was absolutely uh, obsessed with building big battleships. Uh, you may ask, uh, how come Soviet Union never had any during the war? Well, Soviet Union always had limited resources, so money and power and, and uh, manpower was put into building land forces first. Right. Navy came second, but there were some serious battleships under construction. Uh, one Germans captured uh, unfinished at Novorossiysk when they when they when they took the the city, mm -hmm. and uh, um, Nikolaev. And you could uh, ask, was it Soviet Union alone that was building? No, th this was built by the Germans. The battleship was built by the Germans. It was a German contract. Uh, some of the major Soviet ships were Italian ships. So, but Soviet Union finally uh, developed a capacity, industrial capacity. In 1944, they were looking forward to building, to building their own, and to building a big uh, sea-going, uh, ocean-going fleet, or several fleets. They would need right. the Pacific as well as Atlantic, Northern. Uh, Northern. Uh, so that explains why naval awards became necessary. Another 
part of it is that uh, Soviets already had awards for other services. There was never, curiously, a special medal for Air Force, but pilots were lavished with other decorations. Right. So from the first days of the war, there were many awards that were almost automatically given to that were almost automatically given to pilots or navigators or uh, Air Force engineers, combat uh, you know uh, navigate uh, combat uh, technicians that were. Uh, that, that flew a certain number of missions that were successful, or shut down a certain number of airplanes, or destroyed a certain number of targets on the ground. Uh, and because of, of that and sheer numbers, there were plenty of medals given to aviators already by that point. So it wasn't really necessary to lavish them even more. Navy, on the other hand, mm -hmm. was a poor cousin right. to other services. I guess they needed some encouragement. They did some need tangible encouragement. Absolutely. So I think that's why such a late date, and why the award even appeared at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that we've looked at the historical circumstances, let's talk about uh, what makes them rare and interesting, beside the looks, which we'll, we'll talk about uh, next. Uh, there were only fifteen thousand issued, and that's a tiny number a tiny of number. Ushakov medal. Uh, by Soviet standards, we are talking a uh, humongous conflict that went on for years, for years of war. Uh, we are talking millions of people in, engaged at any given time on the Soviet side. The Soviet army was millions and millions strong at any given time. It was always numerically larger than German army for that matter, even from the first day. Uh, there were millions of medals for valor issued for that reason. Remember. In the beginning, it could be given to any rank, and it could be given to any serviceman. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no special medal for Navy, so Naval personnel would get it too, Air Force men would get it too, occasionally. Uh, but all the land troops, and of course millions of soldiers fighting at any time, some short of bravery. So there were four and a half, roughly, a uh, million of medals for valor issued. Four and a half million, think about it. Uh, something like maybe 4.2 million during the war alone wow. and no more. Uh, but out of that huge number, um, out of that huge number, compare that huge number with this, this, this medal for medal for Shakur, uh, that's one to 300 in my rough estimate, mm -hmm. yeah. something like this. Yeah. So this is how rare it is compared to medal for Valor, for example, mm -hmm. which is roughly an equivalent. Uh, Medal for Valor in the order of ranks or in the order of precedence goes just ahead, uh, uh, is just above uh, Ushakov Medal. Mm -hmm. And that's just because of chronology. It doesn't mean that you have right. to do something bigger or better to get a Valor Medal. It just so happened that Ushakov came next. Now uh, that we've touched on that, oh, yes, one other interesting thing I almost forgot to, to mention. Um, this medal was occasionally issued to Americans, believe it or not, to foreigners. Typically, uh, foreigners were awarded with any Soviet decoration, very rarely. It was exception, not a rule. Uh, there were some, like Orders of Red Star, even Order of Glory, uh, other orders, very, very rarely medals, because to get a, a Soviet decoration, one had to be noticed. Yeah, you would right. have to be a general or an officer. Right. And then you, you, and you would get you're worth an order, not a medal. Exactly. Right. So medal was kind of off, off mm -hmm. uh, a little bit um, inappropriate, almost, you Between could say. Price. Right, right. Yeah. But uh, nevertheless, fi nevertheless, five uh, uh, Ushakov medals were issued to Americans. You know. So that's... Um, American Navy? Uh, American Naval personnel, yes. Uh, NCOs, as far as I remember. Possibly one officer, if I'm not if I'm not wrong, but don't quote me here. Uh, that's uh, out of total of about 800 plus U.S. decorations, uh, Soviet decorations issued to Americans in total. Wow. So think about it. Yeah. 800 plus, five, just five or so medals. So it would be incredible to find <laughs> an actual <laughs> documented or, or number actual veteran yeah. who is still yeah, wearing one. Well, or, or just, just find the medal. Yeah. I, I've never heard of one being at least offered. Uh, on the yeah. market, but that, that would be a glorious day to see one of those. Uh, now concerning the construction of the metal, that's another thing that makes it very unique, and I want to show uh, what makes it so unusual. 
And now they'll discuss how the medal actually looks, what makes it so unique, why is it so interesting and uh, very different from really anything else that Soviets ever designed. Well, first you will notice that the medal has this unique part. It's a chain. The chain is made separately from the suspension and it's the only uh, medal that has anything resembling this element is completely foreign to all other Soviet medals. Of course, it means to represent an anchor chain. You will see that the medal itself, the medallion is very complex. Again, very unlike other Soviet medals. Typically, they're very succinct. The message is there and uh, they try to keep it, keep it short, so to speak. Here we have much many more elements than what you typically see on a Soviet medal. And of course, uh, this anchor stands out. Uh, look how eyelet is a part of the anchor, completely unlike any other Soviet medal. Medallion itself is quite large and heavy. It's made in sterling silver, just like most uh, other high-end Soviet decorations. Practically all of them were made either in silver or in gold in some cases even platinum. Uh, speaking of platinum, the first class of Ushakov medal was made in platinum. Mm. Uh, second class in gold with enamels, and uh, the medal is silver. Uh, so medallion is very massive. It's very uh, three-dimensional, so to speak. And on the back of the medallion, what we have is again the anchor. And that anchor is a very peculiar thing for other reasons as well. This is one of the ways to tell that the medal is real by looking carefully at the anchor. Because believe it or not, this is a separate part. This back portion of the anchor, the main body of it, uh, the arms, everything on top, uh, it's a separate portion. And you can see, if you take a very close look at any Ushakov medal, even though they the parts are joined together very tightly at the mint, you can usually see at least part of the dividing line here. This is a clear indication that, not necessarily that the metal is definitely real, because fakers learned and tried to imitate this, mm -hmm. either by making a phony line, uh, which is often exaggerated, uh, much more pronounced than it should be, mm -hmm. uh, or... Um, they uh, they actually make metal out of two parts. I've seen fakes like that as well. But at least this you, this is your first line of defense. If you don't see this line, if the metal is one piece construction, the medallion is one piece construction, it's a definite indication that this is not a real World War II medal at least. Or not, I should say, not a medal of the Soviet period. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that. All, all Soviet Ushakov medals, all Soviet Ushakov medals, I mean, issued from 1990, uh, 1944 until uh, 1993, two years after the Soviet Union already collapsed, they continued the issue continued existing wow. inventory, but all and every single one of them is made by single die. There are no variations of the first type, of the Soviet type of the Ushakov medal. And that's wonderful for collectors. It's also understandable why. The reason is very simple. The metal was produced in such a small numbers that the dye simply didn't have survived. time so to wear survived. out and break, mm -hmm. as it happened in many other cases. Mm -hmm. Also, this was uh, such a small, such a limited production. It was all made at the same time, most likely, but definitely at the same place. There were several mints uh, during at least Second World War. There was Leningrad Mint, original, the, the main one. There was Moscow Mint. And... Part of the Leningrad, big portion of the production lines of Leningrad Mint was evacuated when Leningrad came under siege, just right. before the city was completely blockaded by the Germans. Uh, they relocated to the faraway town of Krasnokamsk, and mm -hmm. there at Krasnokamsk, using original dyes in many cases for early decorations, the production continued. It was set up again, and you could say that Krasnokamsk Mint probably played the decisive role in production of most Soviet orders of World War II period. But, uh, obviously, because production dispersed between these three main mints, and there were a couple of other uh, facilities. Uh, there was uh, 
the famous platinum pre-bore factory in Moscow, oh, for yes. example, that produced yes. some mm -hmm. MZPP, so-called, um, a factory that produced some of the orders that were in high demand, like order of Red Star, for example, order of Petyachik War. Bizushakov medal, it never happened. And for that reason, there is only a single die. If there is any deviation from this die, from this norm, from this absolute standard, you know that the medal is fake. I'm sorry to say, but if you medal, check, check carefully if you already have collectors who already have uh, this medal in your collection. Check carefully, face the reality. If it doesn't have things that I'm about to show you, it means that it's a sad truth mm -hmm. to look for another one. Uh, unfortunately, this medal is very often faked. It's, it has always been scarce. It has always been relatively expensive compared to other Soviet medals of the period, uh, one of the rarest of all. Uh, it's also a decoration. It's a higher-end award as opposed to uh, campaign medals, for example. It's a decoration for bravery. Uh, so it allowed, uh, it gave uh, many more privileges to its uh, recipient uh, as opposed to uh, lower end awards, such as, for example, medal for victory over Germany or medal for the defense of Stalingrad even. For all those reasons, you have to be very careful when buying an Ushakov medal. And we will get into details of it in just a moment. Yeah. But before we get there, let's talk about variations. There are variations, but these variations go only as far as the serial. So of all the Soviet era Ushakov medals, again, it's a single die, no variations as far as details of the face, mm -hmm. details of the lettering, details of the reef, uh, how the medal is made, there's absolutely no, uh, there are absolutely no variations in that. There are variations in how the serial number looks. Mm -hmm. And the uh, more vast majority of them, uh, with the serial numbers in approximate range of 1 to 15,700. So vast majority of the medals. Uh, basically the entire range mm -hmm. of the serial numbers. Uh, the numbers are just like this one. In this specific font, and I'll show a few other examples, in this specific font with this specific spacing between the characters. There is a variation of it. You could call it second variation that has a spacing between the digits that's very narrow. So it's a more compact serial number, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it looks differently, the font looks slightly differently, and that is found in the serial number range of 12,600 to 15,600. This is very approximate, of course. Uh, and you can see that the two ranges do overlap. Uh, oh. So why it happened, nobody knows. They changed the way that they stamped the numbers at some point and then continued with the old system. Maybe there were a couple of production lines at the same facility oh, that were simultaneously stamping certain ranges. That's also possible. But whatever is the case, this narrow spacing version is uh, more rare. Uh, it's not really that important because we are not talking about major differences or any difference for that matter in the medal itself. Mm -hmm. Medallion looks, again, just the same. Uh, there is a version of medal where um, an engraved number occurred. Uh, most likely explanation for that is that uh, when they produced the medal, they simply forgot. They simply uh. forgot to put the number there. And then when they catch up, caught up with it, mm -hmm. uh, it was too expensive to just throw it in the yeah. uh, junk, here, uh, junk pile, and they just engraved the serial number. That, that's my guess, but we, we don't really know. It's a very rare case. And lastly, as many other numbered Soviet decorations, there are duplicates. Duplicates were issued to those who, could, uh, who lost their medal, uh, could prove that the reason was legitimate, it wasn't mm -hmm. due to negligence. And in that case, special edict was, was made by the, uh, by the government to issue medal with the original serial number, but stamped in different font entirely. It would be in small and that block. was a requirement. That the it was a requirement that the font has to typically be would have to be different, mm -hmm. except for early cases, but we won't go there. But in, in vast majority uh, of cases, it would be a, a stamped, serial number, but a much smaller font, distinctly different. Now that we get that out of the way, 
I will talk briefly about other types. And by the other types, I only mean medals that appeared later, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So they would be relevant to most Soviet collectors, but I have to mention it nevertheless. There is a Type 2 that was uh, issued at some point in night started being issued at some point in 1992 and was issued for just a couple of years until 95. It's a very interesting, very interesting uh, case. The medal, again, the medallion itself, mm -hmm. was made using the same die as the original die. So all the uh, tiny details of the die remained exactly the same as on the early Soviet period medals. Okay. However, there was one big difference. The um, second type of the medal is indeed one-piece construction. Remember oh. what I just said about original medals of the Soviet period? Right. The number uh, always have to be two-piece construction. The new version, the second version that, existed, that was issued for just a couple of years did not have that feature. In all the other respects, however, all the ADAC increases of the die, all the die flows that I'll show, mm -hmm. remain the same. So they use their, their original machinery, the original die that they had, they just changed the technological process to simplify things, I suppose. Because remember, in 1992-93, Russian economy was in ruins. In ruins, yes. So it's, it's not surprising that they try to cut corners. Another feature of this Type 2 is absence of serial number. There was no serial number whatsoever on the Type 2. And lastly, it's very interesting to just mention briefly who received this, uh, this medal, the second type. Good chunk of them went to war veterans, for whatever reason, uh, deserving uh, the medal, but never people who never got mm -hmm. it for whatever reason. And uh, there were a number of them, I would say majority of them, I would say even vast majority, uh, were, that was awarded to former naval cadets of Soviet junior naval academies that were orphans of naval personnel. And they were in this way taken special care by the state. Oh. They were sent to this, you could so, say, a very infamous place that used to be a monastery uh, before the Soviet times. Uh, it's called... Uh, typically, it's called Salavki. The correct yeah. name is Salavetsky Ostrova, Salavetsky right. Islands. Uh, the location of it is uh, in um, the White Sea near Kola Peninsula. Right. So uh, we are talking extreme northwest of Russia. Of Russia yes. uh, not very far, generally speaking, of Arkhangelsk, mm -hmm. port of Arkhangelsk, and it's to the east of Port of Murmansk. So if mm -hmm. you look it up on the map, right. you will see the place. It's a tiny island. Uh, it was uh, a home to, to, a, to a very famous monastery, very respected one. In the imperial times, of course, when Bolsheviks took over, bo uh, the, the monks were either killed uh, or, or thrown out. Uh, let me guess, they made it a prison camp. Exactly. Like most natural Why thing not? for them. Yeah. So what they did is, under uh, Lenin's regime, uh, don't assume that Stalin was the big villain and Lenin was such a sweetheart. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Uh, concentration camps in at least Russia were Lenin's invention, none, uh, none other. And uh, in 1921-22, they uh, organized a big prison, a very infamous one for the reason that it was mostly an extermination camp. These people who were sent there would never see the light of day again. Yeah. In vast majority of cases, many political prisoners, mm -hmm. many of the intelligentsia right. who were found unreliable, uh, and very few made it back. It was basically uh, used as a holding pen before people were shot or sent to you know, die of certain right. death somewhere in the, uh, in the polar camps. Yeah, it, the, was, it became a synonym for yeah, being yeah, incarcerated, yeah, yeah, to yeah. be sent to Solovki. To Solovki, mm -hmm. yeah. And unlike many other prisons, this was probably, usually more often than not, it was, right. it was death sentence. Uh, now, uh, in 1940 or so, they, uh, or 39, uh, more likely, they closed the camp. It was no longer needed. First of all, probably because of its notoriety, they already had a huge system of gulag camps uh, in other areas where prisoners would be productive 
and able to actually uh, do some good for Soviet economy, uh, like digging for minerals, for example, uh, or cutting, cutting, logging, and, and so forth, and building roads. So there was no need for a remote camp like Solovki anymore. Mm. Also, repressions kind of burned out uh, the mass terror. Uh, of course, there were many people still thrown in jail every minute of every day, but uh, there was no need specifically for Solovki camp. So they uh, decided to use their now abandoned facility during the war to make an, a school for naval cadets. Very frugal of them. Yeah, well, of course, nothing goes to waste. <laughs> it's typical mm -hmm. uh, of a regime like this. And this naval uh, cadets, young boys uh, in, in, the, in their teens, uh, would graduate within a year and then take part in the fighting. Mm -hmm. And not very many of them survived. And, and uh, they fought very heroically with the rest of the Baltic fleet, uh, with Ladiga Flotilla. And uh, at the end, when the time came to award them with this medal, uh, there were only something like 1,250 of them alive. Oh, wow. 1,250. And uh, out of, uh, uh, that's out of the total of about 1,400 of Type II medal issued. So if you see a Type II medal, even though it's not a Soviet medal, strictly speaking, mm -hmm. it's issued for something that happened during the war. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think it's relevant to Soviet medal right. collectors and World War II medal collectors. And last, uh, very briefly, Type Three. that's post-1995. This uh, is one of the so-called Yeltsin's Awards, when Russia finally established a brand new award system. Mm -hmm. Some of the names remained, but the medals were made differently than the, in, in the early days. Uh, Ushakov medal generally looks the same, uh, the one from 1995. Mm -hmm. However, uh, it has serial number engraved, and unlike the number that you he see here, uh, it's on the left side of the medallion, looking oh. from the back, and it also has a mint mark of Moscow Mint, a round mint mark oval mint mark with mint logo in it. Uh, this one was made using a different die. So you won't notice the fine details that I'll be discussing next on that third type. You do, however, see all the die flaws, uh, all the die breaks uh, in the, on the second version, as well as on all the first. Mm. So by large, what's most relative to, uh, relevant to most collectors most of the medals, vast majority that you are going to see, are going to be World War II issues. Even if they were awarded after the war, which is quite rare, they are still going to be the same medal, as long as it's Soviet period. All the numbered medals, um, these numbers up to 15, 16,000, uh, they are uh, standard, same way, same exact details. All right, now that we discussed that, let's finally get to some fine points of construction. Mm -hmm. Medallion, die flaws, and uh, all those things that you absolutely must know when you, uh, when you are looking for a medal and not sure uh, if it's real or not, this is where you need to, right. to check. Uh, this is, this, this, this are, these are the absolute must things. And I made some sketches to illustrate what I'm talking about. Well, let's start with the front, with the verse okay. of the medal. Can I ask you something? Can, yes. Can, can we move it all a little bit yeah. to the right, including yeah. the, your, yeah. your sketches so we can kind of cover it? Here we go. So look first at the star. Right here above, above the portrait of Admiral Lushakov, Imperial Admiral, mm -hmm. who fought very well against the Turks. That eventually led to... Uh, it was a Turkish war, to, to, to war with uh, France and, uh, and England because Russia was doing too great in the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Western powers didn't necessarily like that. Um, but I digress. So anyhow, uh, the portrait is important because it always has to be in this specific way. Uh, so if, if the person here looks strange, uh, doesn't look like the portrait that you see here, well, you know the medal is mm -hmm. definitely mm -hmm. fake. Details of the color, you see how intricate they are, the patterns here, uh, the hair, the um, forehead, eyes, right. and so forth and so on, always the same. If you see something odd, clear indication mm -hmm. that it's not real. 
But once one peculiar point that's very difficult to fake is the star. The star is of very irregular shape. And what I mean by that, I try to sketch it here. Pardon my poor uh, drawing yeah, abilities. Uh, but this is the star. Uh -huh. there it, is. it has points, like any star. Right. It's a five-sided star. Well, one of the points is missing. It's chopped off. Hmm. Uh, so on all the regions... And that's a die irregularity. This is an irregularity uh -huh. of the die. All the original medals have this feature. Blunted. Blunted, too. blunted uh -huh. lower left arm. Wow. Another feature is location of the apex of the star. It's a little skewed. Remember how in one of our episodes we discussed the irregularity of the hero star? Because right. it's three-dimensional... Uh, it has this almost weird looking top. The apex of the star is skewed. Mm -hmm. Two of the arms are meeting in one spot, three other are, or ridges rather, meet at another spot. Mm. Uh, so it's kind of all over the place, but it's always in the same specific uh -huh. way. Here, too, we have a point where the um, ridges meet. Mm -hmm. in the center, it's not really in the, center. It's, in the center, it's off-center, mm -hmm. it's skewed to the bottom and to the right, right. or you could say southeast, uh -huh, uh -huh. it makes it easier to right. remember. So it has to be to the southeast. The ridges themselves are irregular, they're kind what of wavy. Not straight. Not straight. Wow. Not straight, not entirely straight anyway. You will only see it on medals that are not too worn. And again, return to what I said before, probably more than once, it's important to have a medal in nice condition. Because if all the details are completely worn out, how can you tell? Exactly. Uh, now uh, on from uh, the construction of the star and the portrait itself to a very interesting detail of the reef. And here's the reef that I'm talking about. And you will notice that reef consists of uh, what's supposed to be laurel uh, leaves. Mm -hmm. And among the leaves, there are tiny little berries here. And right. There. You see them, right? The laurel berries, yes. Laurel berries, exactly. Now, if you take a very close uh, look, and I, again, try to sketch it here. Mm -hmm. The first berries to the left and right of the center, you see where the little ribbons Cross the first berries on in the upper portion of the reef. I'm talking about here and here. Mm -hmm. They have a very interesting peculiarity, and uh, you may not see it in our photo here of the of the metal. We'll try to uh, show a larger picture, but what I'm talking about is this. This berry is really like a coma. It has this continuation, this little tail. Mm. All the regionals have it. Moreover, it's an important feature because it's kind of recessed. Mm -hmm. It's not the one that's going that's uh, first to wear so it's out. It's not going to be wear out. Exactly. It's first to wear so out. it's very mm -hmm. likely that you will see this place well enough, even mm -hmm. on a worn medal. Wow. Uh, look horrible. for this little comma, right? As opposed to just regular berry. Now, when when you look on the right. And you look at the right portion, mm -hmm. and the first berry on the right, in the upper part of the reef, mm -hmm. not this one, but this mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. you will see that there is a little tiny, uh, you could call it, some people call it satellite, or little like extra <laughs> detail, like extra berry. Part the berry of, moon. Yeah, like <laughs> little little tiny like crescent of a uh -huh. berry, located to the right of it. Huh. So, Point number one, point number two, right. both uh, invariably occur, appear wow. on all the original medals without an exception. Wow. You will definitely see that little feature. And I don't know if you can see it I, here. I don't think we can magnify you, it that If much. you magnify it right here, look, right here, you can okay. kind of see it. You can kind of see it. See this little, little, oh, yeah. little dot oh, yeah, to yeah. the right? Mm -hmm. This is what I'm talking about. Now, pan to the left. And you can see the little tail too, little tail here. You see, kind of growing yes. out of the uh, out of the leaf. Uh -huh. This is it. Mm -hmm. Absolute attribute of every region. Now you are armed. Uh, 
one more, a couple of more, more features that are easy to spot, uh, and they are on the reverse. Uh -huh. One uh, is the ridge on, of the anchor. You see the raised ridge here? Yes, yes. On many fakes, especially all the fakes, especially fakes from the naive era, before internet, before knowledge was disseminated, before Paul McDaniel's catalog, for example, a lot of fakes have very exaggerated reach. It's it's much more, more pronounced, raised, more raised, more raised or, okay. and it's along the entire length of uh, the anchor, which is what you don't see in originals. And what I mean by that, look at all the originals that I have, and I'm fortunate enough to have four here. Yeah. This is pretty much how Ridge mm -hmm. should look on all of them. For fakers, it's pretty difficult, actually. The three-dimensional aspect is what usually trips them. So, let me let me ask you. The, the rightmost, the Ridge on the rightmost metal is a little bit shorter than the rest of them. It's just a That's natural normal wear, deviation normal because, of, because, of the di because of how the metal was struck, even. You turn the die a little bit, oh, and I it see. gives you different results. All the die flows will still be there. Mm -hmm. But the geometry may change a little bit, mm -hmm. but not to a huge extent. Okay. And lastly, again, looking at the back, you see this uh, part of the anchor? Yeah. Uh, and uh, this part, uh, the, the bar, or, uh, the correct name for it is stock of mm -hmm. the anchor, has a little depression going longitudinally along the, middle, yeah. along the center, mm -hmm. here, here, here and here on all the original metals to some extent oh, yeah. you should be able to see it mm -hmm. it's interesting that fakers often know what to fake so they may know about this detail but when they try to imitate it yeah, it will come exaggerated easy, right? it will come it will uh -huh. come ridiculous like, uh -huh. very deliberate so it's not a groove it's not something that was scratched it's or an, engraved it's an accident it's just of the an diet. accident uh -huh. of the diet, absolutely uh, now discussion of the Ushakov model would not be complete without discussion of the chain. And this specific part of the metal is what most makes it very interesting, first of all, and what also determines its value, because in very many cases, this original chain, in sort of flimsy, mm -hmm. is missing. Uh, it often gets replaced with a replica. And I'll show you, uh, even though they may look the same on the first glance, how two of these medals have a regional chain and how the other two have a chain that's a very well-made replica mm -hmm. in silver, just like the original mm -hmm. chain, mm -hmm. but different when you take a close look and you know what to look at, what, what, what specific features to look for. First of all, the chain... Uh, as I said, it's in silver. It was always stamped, just like the metal itself, never die cast, right. never uh, cut out of piece of metal using some primitive mm -hmm. means. Mm -hmm. No, it was done in the factory in a professional way. And because of that, the size of the links and the shape of the links stayed the same from chain to chain, more or less, uh, without much deviation. Mm -hmm. uh, the chain, uh, the larger links of the chain, supposed to be about one millimeter thick. And it may vary from my experience from anywhere from 0.9 to 1.1 millimeters, but mm -hmm. not much mm -hmm. more than that. I would be very suspicious if it's, if it's more than that. The thickness of the connecting links, the smaller links of the chain, here. Right. Here. This is supposed to be uh, about 0 0.7, 0 0.8. It was made always of the same type of wire that never changed. Uh, again, if you see deviation from that, significant deviation, then it's certainly a replacement. Some chain links may be replaced even when the other parts of the chain are original. That's common uh, to see. Of course, it's very nice to have uh, an original chain entirely. Uh, it connects to this little bars at the top. Again, they're done in a very professional metal, uh, manner. And here I'm showing the correct type of bars that are connected in the correct way, diagonally, to the main part of the suspension. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, this happens to be a pretty late suspension, post-war suspension, early post-war. Mm -hmm. uh, I have other metal here 
also with a regional suspension. That's wartime. And again, you see that this is done pretty professionally. You don't see a lot of solder. You don't see regularity in the way that these parts look. Mm -hmm. Now look at these ones. See how crude they are oh, by yeah. comparison? Like they're flat, they're squished, uh, flat. Uh -huh. they're very irregular shape. Mm -hmm. These are replacements. Right. This is not an original suspension mm -hmm. for Usha Cold mm -hmm. Metal. Mm -hmm. it, it is a suspension from World War II. Both of them are original suspensions, but just for a different metal. Mm -hmm. Usha Cold Metal was made differently. Uh, the front of the suspension tells even more. And what I mean is, look at how links are. And I don't know if, 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 if our camera can actually show it. Let, turn but, closer to the light here. But... Look at the edge of each of the larger links. You see the little grooves there, and I again try to illustrate it in my sketch here. Let me show which one the top oh, portion. Uh -huh. You see there yes. are little grooves yes. left by the stem, by the cutting machine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this, by the way, is common for many things, not just this particular link, but in general, items, badges made using this method would have these little grooves mm -hmm. on the edge. Mm -hmm. It concerns not just Soviet, uh, some German metals, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, also, uh, because of the technological process that they used, the sheet of metal that was cut into pieces, into these oval pieces, and then again talking about larger links, there were grooves left on the surface. This, this type of grooves that you see here, mm -hmm. And you can kind of see them in our picture. You see, they may be at different angles depending on what zoom in a part of the. Oh, yeah. See little oh, grooves yes, going yes, yes. generally they in one direction. Uh -huh. But parallel to each other. Exactly. Well, on different links, they may be in different, right. going in different, like, in different mm -hmm. uh, direction. direction, but they are almost always there, mm -hmm. at least to some extent, if you take a very close look. Again, look at the other original, same thing. But when you look at the copies, oh, there they are, yeah. When you look at the copies, what have we? Zooming in. None of it. None of it. Nope. None, mm -mm. Of it. None of it. Here's another one. Again, something that's difficult to replicate. I've already seen them trying, but again, they look very deliberate. They're literally scratches. And this is not what they're supposed to be. Right. So don't assume that if you see those lines, there's necessarily an original link. You have to look at other uh, factors. Mm -hmm. But by and large, they have to be of this nature that I just showed you on the first two examples and the ones above here. And they are very hard to imitate. And now the last part about the chain is the small links. The way the small links were made out of metal wire, out of silver wire, mm -hmm. there was a cutting machine that cut the links to necessary size. Right. And you see that they're not joined on the original metal. They're not sorted. They come close to each other, but they're not completely shut. Mm -hmm. There's a little gap. Mm -hmm. They never try to completely close it. Right. And this gap is done in a very neat fashion. The ends of the wire are cut either at straight angle or, in some cases, cut with this guillotine-like machine, mm -hmm. a cutting um, right. mechanism, at an angle, but in a very straight fashion. Right. So when they meet, they they're often parallel, meet parallel, a parallel to each, to each other. Uh -huh. Or even if they're not at the right angle, it's still that they're parallel to each other. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it may be a little bit misshapen, but you see my point. Right. Yes. They will still meet at this, uh, uh, in this fashion. Mm -hmm. There may be a gap, but, but the edges of this, uh, of this ends of the wire are very right. precise. Yes. When you see something like this, or something like this, this is an indication that this is not uh -huh. the correct yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, I see. So now you are fully equipped.
to go and look for an original Vyshakov medal. Well, I'm already looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go too far. Good. Uh, now, uh, since we've discussed the, um, the peculiarity of the medal, the construction, the die flaws and all that, let me just touch very briefly on size, uh, sizes and weights. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always mention that it's not the determining factor. It should not be the only determining factor. Fakers are very smart. They know how to uh, imitate originals. They often use original materials, mm -hmm. meaning if it's a Ushakov metal fake, rest assured it's made of silver. Mm -hmm. No chemical analysis will show right. you otherwise. Right. Uh, they can find silver from the period very easily. Uh, for example, scrap metals. Some of the metals are in such poor condition so that they're not collectible. Right. You simply melt them down. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is easily available in places like Russia, Ukraine, elsewhere, uh, former Soviet Union. So uh, weight and size uh, should not be your only weapon in checking the metal's region, but it's still good to know what the original uh, dimensions and weights are. And I uh, made um, uh, a table, sort of, of original medals that we had in recent years. And I'll be happy to share it with you. Uh, first of all, the weights. Uh, all of the medals, medallions, that mm -hmm. I measured uh, recently, uh, were about 49 grams. And the deviation wasn't too huge. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, um, were about 49 millimeters in width. Mm -hmm. So uh, it may be 49.0, 48.8, uh, 49.2, 49.4, 48.5, 48.8, 48.8, 48.7, 48.4. So the uh, variance is not huge. Mm -hmm. The width remains pretty much around that number. Uh, the, the, um, I'm sorry, the height of the metal, the width, now to the width. 35.7, 35.8, 36.1. Uh, 35.8, 36.0, 36.2. 35.6 is kind of an outlier almost. Right. And this same medal had the height of 48.5, including the eyelet. And that one uh, had a very uh, low serial, 2865 serial number. Hmm. Still an original medal. Uh, weight. Uh, medallion itself, not counting the chain, not counting the suspension, of course. 33.1. 32 32.8, 33.3, 32.8, 32.7, 32.3, 32.0, 32. So all revolving around that. Uh, the lowest but, reading I had was 32.0. That, that's what prompts my question. Is it um, out of the ordinary at all to have such a... Is it a big... Is it considered a big difference? For or? a medal of this size, yeah. at this complexity, mm -hmm. when we are talking two separate parts, and we are talking metal that's bigger than typical metal. This is well without with oh, anything. Okay. So it's it's standard, normal mm -hmm. Soviet medals that are even smaller in size to have a deviation of maybe a variance of maybe 1.5 grams. Oh, wow. Uh, for every 32 grams that metal weighs. Right. Yeah, okay. Was, was okay. Weight, weight. Uh, with the height and weight, to a smaller degree, but still it's the, the case, especially with height. That's why we don't... Uh, I don't like really the height comparison because that includes the eyelet. Right. And that varies so the, much for metal. Especially the most wandering inside. Right. Uh, and, right. And, 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 and also on many metals, it was sorted. So it's, if it's sorted slightly differently, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. affects the mm -hmm. height. Width is more meaningful. And you can see there's really not that much difference between right. them. So the lowest is 35.6. There's another one. Yeah, that's and the highest is what? 30. 36.2. So, so not, point, not too much. Right? Point 0.6 point is all your ranges. Yeah. It looks like it is. Yeah, okay. Half a millimeter. So that concludes our discussion for now about Ushakov medal. Uh, this is just the first part. And in our next episode, we will be discussing specific cases uh, who was awarded for what particular oh, feeds. That's, that's I think it, it may that's make it interesting. interesting yeah. And also the prices. I think mm. many collectors would, that is also very interesting. would want to know. And by the way, Igor, how come all the ribbons look different? 
Oh, this is oh. a good question. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Well, first, first of all, the ribbons may look differently just because of wear. One may be faded. So this one is faded more. It has a little bit more swelling. But this one is a very interesting case. This is not a ribbon for Shakur medal at all. You know what it is? It's a ribbon that's custom made. The fellow who, who owned this medal, who received, the recipient of this medal, mm -hmm. apparently lived far away from a major city or town where they had a military store. There was a chain of stores mm -hmm. called mm -hmm. Ventog, military right. retail chain, uh, where you could buy a ribbon. But if you lived far away in some distant village, you were flat out of luck. Oh, yeah. So where would you get a ribbon to replace your ribbon that you, you know, that, that got soiled or ripped? Well, he found an ingenious solution. He found a ribbon for order of Red Banner of Labor somewhere and literally custom changed it. Added some stitching the, the white, to make it look. The white parts are embroidered. Exactly actually. embroidered to make it look right. So this this one I think is very unique. Yeah. Chain unfortunately is a replacement here, so he mm -hmm. did not have. Maybe he lost his original suspension. Might have broken. Whatever happened, he had to replace it, and this is the way he did it. And mm -hmm. that must command a premium amongst collectors. No, believe it or not, no. it's actually a minus uh, that the chain is missing. Uh, now this is an interesting feature, which I think partly at least alleviates the fact that the chain is not there and the suspension is not original. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a very interesting customization, but no, as far as the price, I think, mm -hmm. uh, this metal will cost you much less, but we'll get to the price discussion mm -hmm. later. Uh, it will cost you much less than a metal that's complete and perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. That was fascinating, absolutely. Oh, fascinating. I hope it didn't put you to sleep. And, uh, <laughs> Wide awake. <laughs> and uh, and waiting for I, the next part. As I said, there will be second part mm -hmm. on the Ushakov medal. And then next portion uh, will be about Nahimov medal. Equally oh. interesting medal. Uh, even more scarce than Ushakov, interestingly. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a lower, um, uh, it's lower in the order of rank than Ushakov. And uh, again, uh, easy ways uh, to tell the fakes will mm -hmm. be discussed, and then specific cases people avoid with the metal. Speaking of Nakhimov, do I remember correctly from my childhood that there was this, well, little by modern standard, but the Soviet cruise ship Admiral Nakhimov, which was actually a uh, captured he, Nazi cruiser. It was his pers personal yacht. Oh, it's his personal as yacht. As far as I know. That's awesome. Yeah, it, well, it sunk, uh, unfortunately, somewhere around yeah, yeah. 1989. Yeah, something, yeah. yeah. 1987. Wow. Uh, lots of people were lost. All right, that would be an interesting discussion too. Okay. Well, that's all that we have for today, and I uh, hope uh, you found it interesting. Very interesting. And uh, I hope you can use the tools I just shared uh, in your collecting hobby. Thank you. Good luck to everybody. Thank you so much. Bye.